Tonight I thought I'd start on something quite different. It's too big a subject to finish tonight, so it's going to be this meeting and next month to get all of it. I wanted to talk about the gospel in the stars. Now, you all know that from time so early we can't trace the beginning of it, that all the ancient peoples knew the signs of the zodiac. And with the one exception of China, they gave to the principal signs of the zodiac the same names. The Chinese called these various signs the pig, the hen, the dog, and so forth, according to the Chinese mentality. But all the others gave these signs of the zodiac the same names, with a few exceptions on some of the minor constellations. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about astrology, because I don't believe there's anything to it whatsoever. But a curious thing, that from the earliest times, even these pagan peoples knew of the different constellations by these names, and as a matter of fact, what this sets out in the stars is the same thing that is set out in much more detail in our Bible. And it does not in any way grow out of or support their paganism. Genesis, of course, is not the earliest book in the Bible. While it talks about the earliest things, of course, Moses wrote that somewhere, uh, say, between 1450 and 1446. B.C. The book of Job we know is still earlier because with all of the philosophic discussion in Job about why he had his troubles, there's no mention in it of the law. And certainly Job's friends would have pointed out this law and that that he must have broken to have gotten into his trouble. But Moses, in the book of Genesis, <coughs> records the earliest prophecy in point of time when it was originally given in the Bible. It's Genesis 3, verse 15. God has summoned Adam, Eve, and Satan before him to give an accounting of their misdeeds. And in Genesis 3, verse 15, he says to Satan, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And the same Hebrew word, zera, meaning seed, or figuratively descendants, is used in both cases. So Satan was to have just as literal children as was Eve. And God goes on to say, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, Thou shalt bruise his heel, and he shall, some translations say, bruise thy head, some say, crush thy head. So you have there the first prophecy of the coming Redeemer, who is going to crush the power of Satan, but suffer terribly himself in doing it. Now, from then on, you've got a long gap, because that was approximately 4,000 B.C., and from then down to the time when Moses wrote, or even Job, which goes back probably 600 years earlier than Moses, you've got a long gap without prophecy. Now, you do have some prophetic material in the book of Enoch about which we can't be too certain whether what we have today is the original or not. It's true that one of the books of the New Testament does mention that Enoch prophesied about the coming of God to take vengeance, but uh, the book of Enoch has remained on the apocryphal list because the churches have not been sure whether they could accept it and face value as inspired or not. Now, in that long gap in there from 4,000 to the middle 1400s 
B.C., what was to keep alive the prophecies that God had given. Now, we know, of course, that a much more complete statement was given to Adam and Eve than is recorded in Genesis, because you remember that Abel knew enough to bring the blood sacrifice. And you remember the Apostle Paul says, by faith, Abel brought a better sacrifice than Cain. You can't have faith in something you've never heard about. So the details obviously were given. But how to keep them alive? Now we do know that the Adamic peoples living among the other non-Adamic races discussing these things, some of the things they knew got out among the pagans and appeared in garbled and caricatured form in the pagan religions. Now all the pagan religions of the world are alike. They say that man must make sacrifices to appease an angry god. We have, of course, most details from the Greeks probably, but according to the general pagan theory, as well set out by the Greeks, if you became a little bit too prosperous, the gods became envious that you had all this. So you had to offer sacrifices that cost so much, they really hurt you financially. And so the gods would decide that, well, if you'd been punished this much for it, why, maybe you could get off without anything more. The Christian religion alone has the opposite. It has God making the sacrifice to save man. Now, nobody took the old pagan idea and refined it into what is Christianity. It's obvious that the higher idea in the hands of people of no spirituality was garbled and distorted into the lower form. Ancient tradition says that Enoch and Seth were the ones who worked out the signs of the zodiac. And it may well be because, as I say, among all the pagan peoples of Western Europe and uh, Asia and North Africa, the signs were the same. And it goes back fully that early. Now, only one of these constellations resembles at all the thing it was named after. Scorpio, you can very clearly trace the figure of the great scorpion, his two pinchers out there and the tail curved over his back ready to sting. But as to the others, one and all, the wildest nightmares of a drunken maniac couldn't figure out any resemblance from the star pattern to the thing they named it after. You look at any zodiac, the figures drawn against a pattern of the stars making up the constellation so named. And where the stars are situated on this figure is as random an assortment as if they were fired into it with a shotgun, a poorly choked shotgun. It's a scattered pattern bearing no resemblance at all. So, what caused them then? All these people to recognize these things under the same titles. The ancients, of course, believed that the appearance was real, that the earth sat still in the center and the stars and the sun went around it. Now, you can tell, of course, at night looking up, you can see when the moon is against the background of a particular constellation. And they say the moon is in that particular constellation or sign. Now, the only way you can tell which one the sun is in is by figuring out the entire circle around the sky and knowing what one is out there where the sun is, because obviously in daytime you can't see anything out there but the sun. The first record that we have recorded form of the signs of the zodiac was called the Illumination of Baal. You remember that Bel was uh, one of the Babylonian names for the god who was the deification of Satan. 
This was compiled by order of Sargon of Agade, about 3800 B.C. Now, the Babylonians were not only astrologers, but they were also great astronomers. You remember, they lived in a desert country, no smog, no coastal fog. On those nights, the stars looked as though you could reach up and grab one. And they studied them diligently, and their larger temples that were in the form of a high tower had an observatory on the top. Now, the story of the Tower of Babel is garbled, maybe worse than most of the things, in your King James Version. In your King James Version, they say, let us build a tower whose top shall reach unto the stars. If you check it in the Hebrew, they say, let us build a tower with the stars on the top. In other words, in the glazed tile pattern with which this thing was covered, they would have the signs of the zodiac set on the top of it. And that was commonly done. We find in Egypt some ruined temples, such as those at uh, Esna and at Dendera, where on the ceiling of the temple the signs of the zodiac were painted in a circle. But Babylonian records show that they kept a careful record not only of eclipses, they had a record of the wanderings of the planets. The early name for planets meant the wanderers. They didn't stay in one place like the other stars. And they would be able to tell you when the star uh, Jupiter was in a particular constellation. That is, you saw it against the background of that uh, constellation. They left records also, not only of comets, but apparently they watched the sun through smoked glass because they left records commenting on the presence of sunspots. So while they didn't have telescopes, as far as we know, the old boys were doing a good job of astronomical observation. Very likely, they did the same thing as the Egyptian priests. Now, to be able to fix the calendar accurately is very important for an agricultural civilization. If you plant your crops a little too early because you've got a spell of warm weather, you wind up losing it because they're frostbitten. And if you wait till a little too late, you don't get much of a crop by the time harvest is there. So to be able to keep track of the calendar was important. Now, as you know, due to the tilt of the Earth's axis, the sun apparently rises high overhead in midday in summer, not as high in winter. It rises over the eastern horizon pretty well to the north of east in summer, pretty well to the south of east in winter, and the same corresponding changes in sunset. So we know that in some of these Egyptian temples, they were laid out so that there was a little window or porthole in the wall so located that when the sun reached the farthest south point in winter, When it rose at that point, the light of the sun would shine through this little hole and fall on a certain marker on an altar way back to the other side of the temple, which told them that from that time on, the sun was going to start rising farther and farther to the north. In other words, you had passed midwinter, December 21st, 22nd, and were going on into the new year. So the priests kept track of the calendar, and because they were the only ones who knew how to do it, it gave them much more importance and influence, and probably the same thing is true of these Babylonian temples that they were used in that way. 
We do know, as far as painting the signs of the zodiac or setting them in mosaic tile designs on the ceilings, that this was done in Babylonian, Egyptian, and Persian temples because we have found enough ruins of it to show it. Now, they divided the complete circle around the sky following the path of the sun into 12 roughly equal segments, approximately 30 degrees each. And in each of these 30 degree segments, there was one large constellation which gave its name to it and scattered around other minor constellations. The word zodiac is derived from a primitive root In Sanskrit, it means the way, probably came down through the Hebrew sodi. In other words, the way followed by the sun, moon, and planets as they passed in front of the background of the fixed stars. Neither the sun, moon, nor any of the planets go more than eight degrees south or eight degrees north of the center line of this, the plane of the ecliptic. Now, the principal constellations or signs of the zodiac are Virgo, the Virgin, Libra, the Scales, Scorpio, the Scorpion, Sagittarius, the Archer, Capricornus, the Goat, Aquarius, the Water Bearer, Pisces, the Fishes, Aries, the Ram, Taurus, the Bull, Gemini, the Twins, Cancer, the crab, and Leo, the lion. Well, in later pagan times, they botched the thing up, perhaps intentionally, and began with Aries, the ram, as the first of these signs, ending with Pisces, the fish. Now, suppose you scrambled the order of things in your Bible. You began in Genesis with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you finally wound up with his crucifixion as the last part of the book of Revelation. You wouldn't get too much out of the story in that order, would you? It would look as though the thing was a final failure. So where you begin on this thing is important. And one mythical ancient animal was the clue to it, the Sphinx. You've heard of the riddle of the Sphinx, and there was a riddle of the Sphinx, and it's not the one you've heard about. The story was, you know, that this mythical animal stopped travelers in the desert and propounded a riddle. If they could answer it, they'd be allowed to go on. If they couldn't, why, the Sphinx would kill and eat them. It had the body of a lion and the head of a woman. Now, the real riddle of the Sphinx was, where do you start on this circle? Which is the first of the signs of the zodiac? Now, in the Egyptian temple at Dendera, the zodiac on the ceiling has a Sphinx painted between the sign of Leo and the sign of Virgo. Now, Sphinx is from the Greek word sphingo, meaning to join, to bind together. Well, where you join the beginning and the end to make a complete circle, that was the riddle of the Sphinx. And they showed the head of a woman. So you began with Virgo. You proceeded to the body of the lion, and Leo was the last sign in the circle. That We'll see what this sets out. The fact that the truths of the Bible were set up there in a brief and general form 
so that people, as long as they watched the stars, would be reminded of these things. That is indicated in the Bible in Psalm 19, verses 1 to 6. It's a bit clearer in Smith and Goodspeed because, as always, your King James Version botches it up to say in some places the opposite of what it means. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the sky shows forth the work of his hands. Day unto day pours forth speech, and night unto night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard, yet their voice goes forth through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them he has pitched a tent for the sun, who is like a bridegroom coming forth from his chamber, and rejoices like a strong man to run the course. From one end of the heavens is his starting point, and his circuit is to the other end, and nothing is hid from his heat. Well, all down through this period, they might forget some of the things that uh, their grandfather told them, that his grandfather had told him, and so on, if they didn't have something like that to remind them of it. You people, how much do you remember of the stories your grandfather used to tell you about the things when he was a child and where the family came from and all that kind of thing. You probably paid no attention. And so with these important things. Well, we know that you must start with the sign Virgo. In all these ancient zodiacs, it's always the same. They show the figure of a woman with a branch in her right hand and a stalk of wheat with the ear, the head of grain, on the stalk of wheat in her left hand. Now the Egyptians said that this represented the goddess Isis, but they gave her the name Aspolia, the seed. Now what's the significance of this, the seed and the branch of the woman? Well, of course, Genesis 3.15 said that the seed of the woman was going to crush Satan's head. But what about the branch? Well, there are several places in the Bible, obviously prophetic, of Christ, which calls him the branch. For example, Isaiah 4, verse 2, In that day shall the branch of Yahweh be beautiful and glorious. Isaiah 11, verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now that's unquestionably prophetic of Christ. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6, Behold, the days come, saith Yahweh, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name whereby he shall be called, Yahweh our righteousness. Now, the brighter stars have been named, and even today astronomers use the ancient names, some of them Hebrew, perhaps more of them Arabic, for at least 150 of the brightest stars. And their names are quite significant. One of the stars in this constellation Virgo is called in Arabic Alzima, the branch. Later, the Romans gave it the Latin name Spica, an ear of grain. Another star in this constellation Virgo, Zavijava, meaning gloriously beautiful. Remember Isaiah, in that day shall the branch of Yahweh be beautiful and glorious. Still another star, El Muredim, who shall have dominion. Now, 
whoever named the constellations and the stars knew the Bible story. Near the constellation Virgo is a smaller one, Coma. In Hebrew, it means the desired. The ancient zodiac showed this as a woman carrying a child in her arms. The ancient Egyptian name for this constellation was Shesnu, the desired sun. Well, Haggai 2, verse 7, And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, saith Yahweh of hosts. So, as your starting point, you've got Genesis 3, verse 15 that from the seed of the woman shall come the promised Redeemer who shall rule and have dominion after destroying Satan. Now let's go on to the next one of the signs of the zodiac, Libra, the scales. The Hebrew name was Mozanaim, meaning weighing. The Arabic name, Al-Zubina, the purchase or the redemption. Now, I've talked to you before about the matter of redemption in Bible law. If poverty came upon you and you were forced to sell the family homestead or to mortgage it and lost it by foreclosure, you, if you got the money, could redeem it or if you didn't have it, your next of kin could redeem it for you. He redeemed it by buying it back from the one to whom you had lost it. And inasmuch as you could not part with the family rights to the homestead longer than until the next jubilee year, if at the time you sold your property there were 20 years left until jubilee, why the purchaser got the right to keep the property for 20 years. After five years, your relative decided he'd redeem it for you. So there remained now 15 years of the 20 unexpired. So he would pay three quarters of the original price and buy it back, redeem it for you. Now it's significant here you have the scales, but with the Arabic name, purchase or redemption. You simply cannot make out in the star pattern anything resembling the scales. You know how the ancient scale was. You had a horizontal beam suspended from the middle. And at each end, you had three cords going down, holding a shallow, flat pan in which the things to be weighed were placed. Well, this is drawn as a scale set down flat on the ground. In other words, the beam is lying on the ground. Nearby are these two pans and the cords tangled around. You can find three stars that would fit in the circle of the rim of one of the pans. Other than that, you can't find anything that remotely suggests the way they show the sign of the zodiac. It doesn't look like scales any more than Virgo looks like the figure of a woman. There are three very bright stars in this constellation Libra. The brightest is named Zubin al Janubi, the price which is deficient. In other words, the price that any man can pay, his own death, is not enough for his own redemption. The next brightest star, Zubin al Kemali, the price which covers. Now, you look up in your Old Testament where <clears throat> forgiveness of sins is discussed. The Bible's idea of pardon for your sin 
is not merely that God remembers what you did but just withholds the punishment. The Bible idea is that it is covered up or blotted out. It is no longer seen. And therefore, when it's talking about forgiveness of your sins and that sort of thing, the Hebrew word used means to cover. The price which covers, that's the price paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. And the third brightest star, Zubim al-Akrab, the price of the conflict the conflict between Jesus Christ and Satan and the frightful price that he paid in that conflict. Small constellation, the crown. Small constellation, the crown. Ophiuchus has seized him with both hands and is pulling him away from that. So your symbolism there is not something they got out of paganism, I can assure you. The brightest star in the constellation Ophiuchus is in his head. And in Arabic it's named Ras al-Hagus, the head of him who holds. And he holds the serpent, holds him back from victory. Other stars in Ophiuchus are named Treophus, meaning treading underfoot, and Saif, bruised, Megaros, meaning contending, and Carnibos, the wounding. This is a battle to the death. The constellation Serpens, the serpent that he's grasping, is, as I say, one of these ancient ones shown on these old zodiacs. Again, in the same general portion of the sky is the constellation Hercules. This was so named, of course, by the Greeks. This is shown as a mighty man bending on his right knee his right heel lifted up again as if wounded. Now his left foot is directly over the head of the constellation Draco, the dragon. In his right hand, he's grasping an upraised club ready to strike with it. And in his left hand, he is strangling a triple-headed monster. So it's battle all right. <clears throat> In the zodiac at the temple at Dendera in Egypt, it shows him as a human figure with this upraised club. His name in Egyptian is Bau, meaning he who is coming. They knew he wasn't here yet. The brightest star, which is in his head, is Ras al Gethi, the head of him who bruises. <clears throat> now, as I say, the Greeks perverted everything they touched. It's unfortunate all we know about some of these ancient peoples is what Greek travelers wrote about them after they came back. But it seemed to be an essential part of the Greek character or the Greek civilization that you must always garble things up badly. You find, of course, much Greek writing about the Egyptians, and you cannot find one Egyptian pharaoh, including the one who was on the throne when this Greek writer was traveling in Egypt. You cannot find the name of one Egyptian pharaoh that you can recognize at all. Now, if he tells what he did, that in his day he had a war with such and such a country, you can find out from the Egyptian histories what pharaoh it was. But uh, the names bear no resemblance at all. And they did, in their paganism, garble things up pretty badly. As I say, changing this to their mythical hero, Hercules. Now, the wiser Greeks knew the utter perversion of their paganism. 
Aristotle, for example, in his book Metaphysics, says about the Greek mythology that religion and philosophy had been lost. He said much had been added after the mythical style, and some little had come down and may have been preserved to our times as the remains of ancient wisdom. Polybius says that in his day, religion, such as it was, was recognized as a necessary means to political ends. Neander says that their religion was the fragments of a tradition which transmitted the knowledge of divine things possessed in the earliest times. But he recognized they had only fragments of it by his own time. Well, here you have these figures trampling on the serpent, the scorpion, the dragon. All right. Take Psalm 91, verse 13. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the, lo the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample underfoot. Now the next sign in order was Sagittarius, the archer. This was always shown as a centaur, a mythical figure with the body of a horse and the trunk, arms, and head of a man. And this centaur, holding an arrow, bow and arrow, the bow drawn, ready to let fire, and his arrow is aimed directly at the heart of Scorpio. Now, why the mythical figure of the centaur, if it's setting out Bible truths. Well, the centaur had two definite natures, a higher and a lower, didn't he? He was part man, he was part animal. It was to suggest that the creature that this was representative of also had two natures, Jesus Christ God, and also man. That was very probably the reason for this. Anyway, they all agreed upon the figure. They all agreed upon the name. Hebrew and Aramaic name, Kesseth, the archer. Greek, Toxotes, the archer. Latin, Sagittarius, the archer. Now, in Egyptian and in Coptic, they gave him the name Pim Ma'eri, the beauty of the coming forth. And in the ancient Akkadian, the name was Nunki, meaning Prince of the Earth. Well, here is this figure with his higher and his lower nature, ready to fire an arrow into the heart of the scorpion. Let's try Psalm 64, verses 7 to 9. God shall shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly shall they be wounded. So shall they make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. And all men shall fear, and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider of his doings. Now, Jesus Christ was the one who destroyed the power of Satan, the one who had the double nature of God and man, was the one who was victorious, and while, of course, he will ultimately use the entire power of God the Father to shoot these arrows, don't forget that it was the one with the dual nature who accomplished the triumph. Close to Sagittarius is the constellation Draco, the dragon, shown with his head right beneath the foot of Hercules. Now, from the Orient, that is China and Japan, we've gotten the idea of the dragon as a sort of superheated alligator. 
but among the peoples of Western Asia and the Mediterranean, it was a serpent, not the Chinese or Japanese style dragon. <clears throat> In the zodiac of Dendera, this constellation Draco is showing us a serpent beneath the front hooves of Sagittarius, this centaur. His front hooves are just about to come down on and smash this serpent. And the Egyptian name, Herthent, the serpent accursed, was given to him. The brightest star in the head of, uh, Dra of Draco, Thuban, the subtle. Forty-seven centuries ago, that was the pole star. The next brightest star in the head is Rastabam, head of the subtle one. Arabic, it's called Al-Wa'id, who is to be destroyed. And the third brightest star in the constellation is named Ethanin, the long serpent. The next, number five in the list, Capricornus, the goat, is a strange one indeed, because in all the ancient zodiacs, it's a compound animal, something like the centaur. From the waist forward, it has the four quarters and head of a goat, and the rear half of it is a fish's body and tail. You didn't raise any of those when you were on the farm, did you? Now, it's always shown with the goat just collapsing in death. The front legs are buckled under it. The head is drooping. It's just collapsing in the moment of death. But the rear half, this fish's tail, is squirming with vigorous life. Now, what's all this about? Well, you don't get any solution out of paganism. But go back to the Bible and see what happened with regard to a goat. You remember I've told you about the Day of Atonement. Well, some of you may not have heard it. The symbolism of the animal sacrifices in the Bible was very clearly this. At any time during the year, any Israelite who realized he had committed a sin could go to the temple and offer the animal sacrifice. Not that the Bible said there was any particular merit in cutting the throat of a sheep or a goat, but that you were acting out this statement. I recognize that the penalty of my sin is death, and it has to be my own death unless someone dies in my place. I am offering the death of this animal, not as the real sacrifice, but as a symbol that the time is coming when the Redeemer is going to die in my place. That was the meaning of the animal sacrifices. Now, having done this, he went away cleansed of his sin. He'd left his sin behind him at the temple. It still had to be accounted for, even though not by him. So, all during the year, all the sins of all the people were accumulating at the temple until you came to the Day of Atonement. Now, as is set out in some detail in the book of Hebrews, the high priest was symbolic of Jesus Christ. The high priest was dressed normally in very gorgeous robes, the finest of linen, beautifully embroidered in colors and in gold thread. He had on his head not a mitre. That's some more of the perversions in your King James Version. You've seen the Catholic bishop's mitre, the tall cap cut on top so it looks like the gapping jaws of a fish's head. It was intended to. They got it from the priests of Dagon in Babylon. 
Dagon was the fish god, D-A-G-O-N, spelled in your Bible, and you probably call it Dagon. But that's what it is. What he wore was a turban, not a mitre, on the front of which was a polished gold plate engraved holiness unto Yahweh. Then <clears throat> he had on his breast, the breastplate, an embroidered pouch of linen, and attached to that another plate of polished gold set with twelve gemstones, each stone being engraved with the name of one of the tribes of Israel. What are you going to do if you want to try to make a person symbolize the majesty of God? It's an impossible thing, but about the best you can do is to give him some very ornate uniform, at least, to set him apart, isn't it? So that's what they did. And the high priest ordinarily wore this uniform which was symbolic of the full majesty of God. But on the Day of Atonement, there was a very special ceremony. Now, he was only a man. He had his own sins, which barred him from acting out the part of Jesus Christ until he first offered a sacrifice for his own sins, so that cleansed of those, he was now permitted to go on and act out the part. He offered then a sacrifice to cleanse the temple of the sins of the people which had accumulated throughout the year. Now, as you know, the layout from the tabernacle in the wilderness right down through Solomon's temple and all was three parts. There was an outer court into which the people could come bringing their sacrifices which they handed over to the priests. There was an inner court containing the altar where the priest burned the sacrifices on the altar, and there was an innermost, holy of holies, into which no one could go, not one of the priests, except the high priest only, and he could enter it only on the one day of the year, the Day of Atonement. Now, in this holy of holies, the ark, of the covenant, the chest in which the stone tablet with the Ten Commandments written thereon by the finger of God, and Aaron's rod that budded to show that God had chosen him to be the high priest, and a golden jar full of a sample of the manna. These were contained in this chest. It was about four feet long, about two and a half feet wide, and, uh, oh, 18 or 20 inches high. Set down flat on the ground, it would make a seat that one could sit on. And it was called the mercy seat. God said, I will be sitting there in the Holy of Holies. Now, on each end of it, there was a large carved and gilt statue of an angel with outstretched wings. They were so placed that the angel at the left end, his right wing extended out over the Ark of the Covenant to the center point, and the angel at the other end, his extended wing came out to meet this one, so they formed a canopy over the mercy seat. <clears throat> well, this, of course, represented heaven where... God, in all his majesty, maintains his headquarters. Now, the high priest, having cleansed himself of his own sins and cleansed the temple, two goats were brought to him, chosen on behalf of the entire nation. And by casting lots, one goat was selected to be offered as a sacrifice for the people. The other goat, your King James Version, with its customary distortion and mistranslation, says one goat for a scapegoat, and there's nothing like it in the original Hebrew at all. It says one goat for Azazel. 
Now, Satan is not a name of any person at all. It's a title. It means the opponent, the adversary. Manager is not a name. Even if you're speaking of manager of some particular company, it doesn't tell you who is the manager. And Satan doesn't tell you who is the opponent. The other title used in the Bible, Lucifer, the shining one, again is not a name but only a title, and it doesn't tell you who he is. And you've got to look in the book of Enoch to find the answer to that because the Bible itself does not explain about Azazel, although it does mention him, one goat for Azazel. In the book of Enoch, it tells how the rebel angels coming to earth had decided to intermarry with human women and... uh, that their descendants were giants, and that these angels, rebel angels, were teaching men all kinds of sins. Now, it gives the names of 20 or 30 of the principal ringleaders, and one of these is Azazel. So God sends a committee of four of the great archangels down there to investigate and report back. That's very similar to what you have in God's investigation about Sodom and Gomorrah before destroying them. So they come back and they say, yes, it is every bit as bad as it was reported. So God tells one of them, I forget which one now, Raphael or Uriel, he says, you two... Ozozel ascribe all sin. There wouldn't have been any sin committed by men if he had not taught them so. To Ozozel ascribe all sin. Now you go down there and tie him up and cast him into a pit out in the desert and we'll leave him there till I get around to his final judgment. Now note the symbolism of the Day of Atonement. These are goats now, not sheep. One goat is chosen as a sacrifice for the people and one goat for Azazel. Now the high priest takes off these magnificent robes of office, bathes, dresses in plain white linen, symbolic of sinless purity and comes back to perform the ceremony of the Day of Atonement. Jesus Christ, laying aside the full majesty of the Godhead, to come in the form of a man, but a man with no sins of his own. Now, the goat on behalf of the people is sacrificed, and the high priest takes some of the blood of the sacrificed goat, and he goes in through the veil, into the Holy of Holies, and sprinkles a little of this blood of the goat in front of and on the mercy seat, reminding God all these sins that earned the penalty of death have been paid for. Here is the shed blood to show they've been paid for. They're entitled to thy pardon. Then he comes out of the Holy of Holies, He puts on again his majestic robes. You remember in the book of Hebrews it tells us how Jesus Christ is our real high priest and he is in the heavens until the time of the restitution of all things when he will come back. So, symbolic of the return of Jesus Christ, not the second time, in the form of a man to be pushed around and murdered, but coming back with all the majesty and power of God. And he takes the remaining goat for Azazel, and this one is not sacrificed. He lays his hands on the head of this goat and confesses over him all the sins of all the people. And then this goat is dragged out of the city to the edge of the desert and given a good sound kick and sent on out into the desert. He's going back to Azazel with the message. 
Hear, Azazel, all these sins are yours. For you there's no sacrifice. You answer for these. So, by the goat, the one sacrificed, that goat died, but the people received life by it. And, of course, that goat sacrificed in behalf of the people was again symbolic of Jesus Christ by his death, paying the death penalty for us. Now get back to our figure of Capricornus, the dying goat. But the other half of him, this fish, squirming with vigorous life. Now you probably know that the cross was not used as a symbol of Christianity for the first two centuries A.D. Up until that time, they used the fish. You remember Jesus Christ had told a couple of his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. And since fish multiply tremendously, forming great schools or shoals of fish, the fish was symbolic of the way Christianity would multiply into great numbers of people of that faith. So, the fish part was living with vigorous life because the goat part died. One of the stars in uh, Capricornus bore the Arabic name Deneb al-Gedi, the sacrifice comes. Incidentally, <clears throat> at the time of the crucifixion of Christ, at that time of year, the sun was in this sign Capricornus and very close to this star, Deneb al -Gedi. So whoever placed the constellation there and knew the significance of it knew also prophetically the time of year when it would be. You remember it was at Passover, so Moses told them what time of year it would be what day of their month it would be. So all this was known from early times. But now there isn't any part of this that evolved out of paganism. There isn't any part of this that can be shown to illustrate or support paganism. The pagan peoples knew that that's what these constellations were supposed to represent. And they even had names for the stars showing the significance, but they were merely repeating what had been taught centuries before and without themselves realizing fully the significance of it. Well, let's take one more and then we'll call it enough for this evening. The next one in line is Aquarius, the water bearer. That's the modern Latin name. It was always shown as the figure of a man holding in his right arm a large urn, the mouth tipped somewhat downward, and a great stream of water pouring out of it. And the stream of water pours down into the open mouth of the fish, slightly below his feet. The fish drinks up all this water pouring out of the open mouth of this urn. That fish was called uh, Pisces australis, the southern fish, to distinguish it from the other constellation of Pisces, the two fishes. Now this uh, Aquarius and uh, the fish, that was very ancient. The early Egyptian zodiac show it, and the Arabic peoples had it too. Now the pouring out of the water, of course, very ancient. Isaiah 44, verses 3 and 4. 
For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. Psalm 65, verse 9. Thou visitest the earth, and waterest it. Thou greatly enrichest it with the river of God, which was full of water. And you remember John 4, verse 14, Jesus Christ said, Whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. So you have the figure of the man, symbolic of Christ, pouring out this water of life, and the fish, remember, the symbol of the Christians, receiving and drinking up all this water of life. So, the one thing that will make sense out of these constellations is the Bible. As against the background of any of the known paganisms, they're meaningless. As compared to the Bible, they make good sense. They illustrate exactly what the Bible is talking about. Starting with the branch, the seed of the woman, he does receive the wound in his heel from Scorpio, but he crushes the head of the serpent. With his hands, he drags it away before it can seize the crown. Everything here meeting the Bible. Incidentally, that wound in the heel, the way these things pass into pagan mythology, appears clearly here. You remember among the ancient Greeks, they had the myth of... uh, who was it now that was killed by a wound in his heel, uh, Achilles? The story among the Greeks was that the mother of Achilles had been warned that he was likely to be killed when he grew up. So she took him to the river Styx, the river that flows between the land of the dead and the living, and she dipped him in the waters of the Styx which was supposed to give him an armor plate skin that weapons wouldn't pierce. But she had to hold him by something or other. She held him by the heel as she dipped him in, and the heel didn't get dipped. That was the one place that was vulnerable to a wound. And so he was killed by a wound in that heel. Now you find another memory of the same thing showing up in the Germanic myths. You remember the hero Siegfried. Siegfried killed the dragon, and a regular river of blood was pouring out of the cut throat of the dragon, so Siegfried stepped under it to take a shower bath in the blood of the dragon to get this same armor-plating effect, which was to make him invulnerable to wounds. But a leaf from a linden tree overhead broke loose and flip-flopped down and landed on his back between his shoulder blades, and that made one spot that the dragon's blood didn't reach. And so the villain Hagen attacked him from behind, hurled a spear into that one vulnerable spot in his back and killed him. Now the source of those things, you can see where it comes that Christ was to have the vulnerable heel. That is, in the act of crushing the head of the serpent, nevertheless, there he received his own wound. Now let's go on to the seventh of these signs of the zodiac, Pisces the fishes. Now, despite the fact that the stars don't themselves outline any such pattern, you find in many ancient temples 
upon a wall or upon a ceiling, they have drawn out the whole zodiac with the figures outlined <coughs> there. Now, the fishes, it shows two large fishes at practically right angles to each other. And there is a broad ribbon or band, one end tied around the tail of each of these two fishes, and quite a long slack in this band. And the middle of it, where it's doubled, is shown fastened to the neck of a sea monster. Now, of these two fishes, with the band fastened to their tail, one of them is trying to swim north toward the pole star. He's looking up. The other one at right angles along the plane of the ecliptic. You remember that among our people always there have been some who were looking up to God for guidance and for the permanent life that's to come. Others who are materialists and quite content with the present situation as long as they can get along in some fashion in it. And so they're shown here. In the zodiac on the ceiling of the Egyptian temple at Dendera, this sign has marked beside it the Egyptian name Picot Orion, the fishes of him who is coming. Now, why fish? Well, not merely because they were an important item of food, but uh, of all useful creatures anyway, fish multiply faster than any others. It only takes a little while for a few fish to become a great shoal or school of fish. And you remember one thing always promised to our people was that the nation of Israel should become very numerous. And fishes were a symbol of rapid multiplication. It's worth noting, incidentally, that a fish was also the first symbol adopted by the early Christians. The cross was not used for a couple of hundred years afterward. But they adopted a fish. As Remember that uh, Christ said to one of his disciples, I will make you fishers of men. Now the rapid multiplication, Jeremiah 30 verse 19, I will multiply them and they shall not be few. I will also glorify them, and they shall not be small. Ezekiel 36, verses 10 and 11. I will multiply men upon you, all the house of Israel, even all of it. And the city shall be inhabited, and the waste shall be builded. And I will multiply upon you man and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. Now this band or ribbon with which these fish were tied was always recognized among the ancients as a separate constellation in itself from the two fish. The Egyptian name for it, Uar, he cometh. The Arabic name, Arisha, the band. Now as I say, the middle of this band is shown fastened to the neck of Cetus, the sea monster, and immediately above is the constellation Andromeda, a woman captive in chains. Now the Greeks elaborated considerably on that with their legend. There was this seaport city where fishing was a very important part of their way of making a living, and this sea monster came along and scared away all the fish, and the town was in a bad way. So they decided the only thing they could do was offer a human sacrifice to this sea monster. So they chose among their people this woman Andromeda, and they chained her to a rock out in the sea. 
and uh, you remember that uh, the hero Perseus came along and rescued Andromeda from that in the Greek legend. Well, you can trust the Greeks, of course, to get everything botched up and wrong that they touch upon. The Greeks had a sort of form of religion, but few of the Greeks, and uh, nothing can be said for the morals of the ancient Greeks, but few of the Greeks were as bad as the gods they worshipped, so they didn't take their religion very seriously. And any poet who wanted to write an epic poem about the doing of their gods was free to do so. There was nothing sacred about it. After all, a bunch of thieves, murderers, uh, drunkards, uh, what have you, if those are all you've got for gods, it's hard to find anything sacred in it. <clears throat> so when it comes to these Greek legends, while you can wonder where the Greeks got the germ of the idea and trace it back somewhere, don't expect to find any truth expressed in any of the Greek legends. Now, the significance, of course, of this, you remember the Bible often speaks of Israel as a personified as a woman, the daughter of Zion. Well, Israel was taken into captivity more than once, you remember, and held captive until delivered by the Redeemer. The Hebrew name of this constellation Andromeda is Sirah, the chained. The brightest star in Andromeda is called al Firatz, the broken down. The next brightest, Mira, meaning the weak, and the third, Adil, the afflicted. Well, now that's the situation in which the nation of Israel was left on more than one occasion, you remember. And God got her out of it from time to time. <clears throat> but listen now to the Bible references to this, which show what this was intended to mean. Isaiah 54, verses 11 to 13. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught by Yahweh and great shall be the peace of thy children. Again, Isaiah 52, verses 1 to 3. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. Shake thyself from the dust. Arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith Yahweh, Ye have sold yourselves for naught, and ye shall be redeemed without money. Now right near to the constellation Andromeda, is another bearing the Greek name Cephus, the king. In the zodiac at the temple of Dendera in Egypt, it bears the name Pekuhor, meaning this one is coming to rule. Cephus, the Greek name, is really derived from the Hebrew Saif, which means branch. And you remember the several references to Jesus Christ as the branch. The brightest star in Cephus is Alderamin, meaning coming quickly. The next, Alphurk, the Redeemer. And the third brightest, which is in the left knee of the figure, al -Rai who bruises or breaks. You remember, he shall bruise thy head. The eighth constellation in this series of twelve of the zodiac is Aries, the ram. The ancient Hebrews called it Tale, meaning the lamb. The Arabic name was Al-Hamal, the sheep. But if you go way back to the ancient 
Akkadians, their name, Bara Zigar. Now, Bar meant altar or sacrifice, and Zigar, making right. So, Bara Zigar, the sacrifice of righteousness. And you remember that a sheep was offered as the sacrifice. It's worthy of note the names given to the two brightest stars. Now these names are very ancient and even today about 150 of the brightest stars in the heavens are still known to astronomers by their ancient Hebrew or Arab Arabic names. The brightest star in Aries, in the forehead of this figure, the ram, called El Naf, or some of the Arabic writers called it El Natik. The wounded, or the slain one. The next brightest in the left horn, Al Sheraton, the bruised. Now, at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, the day of the crucifixion, the 14th day of the Hebrew month Nisan, the sun was in this sign Aries and practically at the point occupied by these two brightest stars. How's that for calling your shots 4,000 years ahead of time? In this sector, named after Ares the ram, nearby and somewhat above Ares is the constellation Cassiopeia. In all these ancient zodiacs, this is shown as a woman seated on a throne. Her right hand is drawing a scarf over her shoulder. Her left hand holds a branch, and with her left hand she's arranging her hair. She is very close beside Siphus, the king. Now the Arabic name of this constellation Cassiopeia, El Seder, the freed. A very ancient name was Daughter of Splendor. The Chaldee name, Dat al Kursa, the enthroned. Now you remember that the nation of Israel is promised that she will be the bride of Christ, bride of the king. Now let's see what Isaiah says about this. Isaiah 62, verses 3 to 5. Thou shalt be a crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, Neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. But thou shalt be called Hephzibah, which means my delight is in her. And thy land shall be called Beulah, meaning married. For Yahweh delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy restorer marry thee. Your King James, mistranslated as always, says, so shall thy sons marry thee, which of course is an absurdity and contrary to Bible law. So shall thy restorer marry thee, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Now going on to constellation number nine, Taurus, the bull. With the exception of the Egyptians, all the ancients called this the bull. The Chaldee name, Tor. Arabic, al -thor. Greek, Tauros. Latin, Taurus, all meaning the bull. In the Dendera zodiac, the name written beside it is Apis, the head or chief. The Hebrew name, Shur, comes from a root with a double meaning, both coming and ruling. In all the zodiacs, Taurus is shown as a charging bull, 
head lowered and those great sharp horns thrust forward. The brightest star in Taurus is Aldebaran, meaning the leader or the governor. The next in the tip of the left horn, El Naf, slain. Within the huge outlines of Taurus, you find also the smaller constellation of the Pleiades, the constellation of the ruler or the judge. Now, I've told you about some of the remarkable things in the Great Pyramid. The fact that in the mathematics of its design, you find astronomical mathematics that our greatest scientists didn't know enough about it to verify until within our own lifetime. So that obviously those were matters of inspiration at the time the pyramid was made. Well now the names given to some of these stars also show inspiration. The brightest star in the Pleiades is called Alcyone, which means the center. Now, you've all seen pictures of spiral galaxies, those great clouds of scores or hundreds of millions of stars that so often are scattered in the form of a great pinwheel across the sky. And you know that our Earth is in a galaxy which appears to us in the sky as the Milky Way. That's one of these great pinwheels and our solar system is located about two-thirds of the way from the center to the outer rim of it. The whole shape of it is more or less lens shape, that is thicker at the center and tapering off thin at the outer edges. It takes considerably over 200 million years for this galaxy to make one revolution. But as nearly as our astronomers can determine today, the center of gravity of the entire galaxy, which has, I forget how many hundreds of millions of stars in it, the center of gravity about which our entire galaxy rotates is about at the position of this star Alcyone in the Pleiades. You remember Job was asked, Canst thou, what is it, break the bands of Orion or loose the sweet influence of the Pleiades? Well, it is a sweet influence, all right, because if you didn't have some center of gravity, about which these stars could move, you'd find them scattering in all directions with a good many collisions. But now back in those days, when there is not even a legend or a myth about anybody having a telescope, how did they find out about this? Well, we're still talking about this big constellation Taurus, the bull. Again, a symbol of the might of God's people Israel. They weren't the biggest nation. They were always running into others more numerous than themselves. But because God was the one who stood back at them and got them out of their difficulties, they had the power to smash many kingdoms. Deuteronomy 33, verse 17 speaking of the tribe of Ephraim. His glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. With them he shall push the peoples together to the ends of the earth, and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Psalm 44, verse 5 adds a little more. Thou art my king, O God, Command deliverances for Jacob. Through thee will we push down our enemies. Through thy name will we tread them underfoot that rise up against us. In this same sector of the zodiac and close to Taurus is the constellation Orion. In the Dendera zodiac, 
The name given is Hagat, which in Egyptian means he who triumphs. And hieroglyphic characters written close to it read Or. Now, we use this Greek word Orion, the name the Greeks gave to this thing, but it was anciently written Orion. It derived from a Hebrew root meaning light. The Akkadian name, Urana, the light of heaven. The Hebrew, however, called the entire constellation Kessel, the strong one, the hero. In all these zodiacs, Orion is shown as the figure of a mighty warrior. With his right hand, he's brandishing a club. With his outstretched left hand, he is grasping the head and skin of a slain lion. His left hand is planted firmly, his left foot, I should say, is planted firmly on the head of an enemy. And it's interesting to note, in his belt is a sword. And on the hilt of the sword, the pommel, the knob at the end of the hilt, is carved in the form of the head of a lamb. Now you don't think of that as a warlike emblem, except you remember what the Lamb of God is able to accomplish. Well, the lion skin and head, yeah, he was not only going to bruise Satan's head, he was going to skin him. <clears throat> In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, we're told, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about, seeking whom he may devour. The names of the stars in this constellation Orion are interesting again. The brightest star, which is in his right shoulder, Betelgeuse, the coming of the branch. Remember, all your references in the Bible to the branch are to Jesus Christ. The next brightest, in his left foot, which is over the head of his enemy, is the star Regal, the foot that crushes. The third brightest, in his left shoulder, Bellatrix, swiftly destroying. The fourth brightest, al the wounded one, and another down on the right leg, Saif, bruised. Remember, his heel would be bruised in the process of crushing Satan's head. Now this enemy he's conquering, that he's got his left foot firmly planted on, you find the Romans uh, messed this up a bit. They called this constellation Lepus, the hare. But it wasn't that way in any of the ancient constellations. That's just a Latin corruption. In the early Persian zodiac, it was a serpent. In the zodiac of the temple of Dendera at Egypt, it is shown as an unclean carrion bird standing on a serpent. And the name given in the Dendera zodiac Vashti Becky. Vashti means confounded, confused. Becky, failing. The brightest star in this constellation are Nebo, the enemy of him who comes. The Arabic name for it, Arnebeth, is the same. Two other bright stars in it. Nebo, the mad or insane and Sujia, the deceiver. Another constellation shown in all these ancient zodiacs <coughs> is a river flowing out from the downcoming foot of Orion where he's stepping on the head of the enemy serpent. Eridanus, the river of the judge. It's an immensely long constellation. 
the ancients always said this was a river of fire. Well, you have to go clear over to the book of Revelation, the latest book of the New Testament, to find this. Oh, no. There's reference to it there, but you will pick it up earlier in Daniel. Daniel 7, verses 9 to 10. I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. The river of fire of the judge. Going on to the tenth constellation of the zodiac, Gemini, the twins, is the least clear as to its meaning. The Greeks claim to have in invented this constellation of Gemini, the twins, and it is entirely possible that the more ancient form of it has been lost because, oh, you can interpret it, but with less certainty. The Greeks called these twins Apollo and Hercules. The Latins called them Castor and Pollux. The Dendera Zodiac named this sector of the Zodiac Clostrum Hor, the place of him who comes. Now, in the Dendera Zodiac, it shows two figures walking toward you. The second of the two figures not sketched too clearly, but looks as though it might be a woman. The ancient Coptic name for this constellation, Pimahi, the United. The Hebrew name, Thamim, meaning United. And the Arabic name, al Talman, again meaning United. Now, the Dendera Zodiac showed these two figures walking toward you, but most ancient drawings of the Zodiac show two seated figures side by side. The one on the left has a club in his right hand, not brandishing it ready to strike, just merely holding it. A few of the old drawings show him with a palm branch rather than the club, but most of them show the club. A star in his left foot is called Alhenna, the hurt or afflicted. Remember that wounded heel. The figure on the right carries a harp in his right hand and a bow and arrows in his left hand. And again, not with the bow out ready to shoot, he's just merely carrying it. In his knee is a star called Mebsuta meaning treading underfoot. Now, both of these figures are simply resting. They're neither in action nor preparing for action. You might say resting after victory. Significance, we can't with too great certainty say. It could be a reference to Jesus Christ's two natures. Man who fought evil but was wounded, and God who conquered. You remember you find in the centaur, again a pretty obvious reference to the two natures, as the centaur was part man, part beast, so Jesus Christ was part God, part man. In this same segment with Gemini are two constellations, Canis Major and Canis Minor, the great dog and the lesser dog. In Canis Major, the star at the tip of his nose is Sirius, meaning the prince. 
The Akkadian name for it was Kasista, leader of the heavenly host. Other stars in it, Wesson, the shining, Adhara, the glorious, Askeri, meaning who shall come, and the Arabic name Al-Shira al jaminia the prince of the right hand. Now, Canis Minor, in the Dendera Zodiac, it bears the name Sibak, meaning conquering. The Dendera Zodiac does not show it as a dog. It shows it as a human figure with a hawk's head and a hawk's tail. Remember, one of their Egyptian gods was so shown. The brightest star in Canis Minor is Procyon, meaning Redeemer. Other bright stars in it, Al-Shira al shemelia the prince of the left hand, Al-Mirzam, the ruler, and Al-Gomera, he who perfects. Compare any of these with any of the ancient pagan religions, and we have a pretty good idea of all of them. And any of these constellations make no sense at all. They have no significance. Compare these with the Christian religion, and you can see where all of these fit in. Now remember, these were people living in a desert land, no smog, no fog. Clear, bright light nights when all these stars were brilliant they would be looking at the stars and the idea was that all down through these centuries looking at the stars they'd recognize these constellations and have a reminder of the thing that was eventually going to be explained in greater detail in the Bible the eleventh of the constellations is Cancer the crab now, in the Zodiac of Dendera, it's shown as a scarab, the sacred beetle of the Egyptians. To the Egyptians, the scarab was a symbol of resurrection and immortality. <coughs> Originally, it was just a grub worm. And then it went into this pupa resting stage, apparently dead and then out of it hatched this winged beetle that could fly off into the air. So they said that this was a symbol that out of death comes resurrection and renewed life. So, not a crab, but the scarab was shown there. The same is true of the zodiac in the Egyptian temple at Esne, and it's also found in a Hindu zodiac of about 400 B.C. Now, it's true that later Egyptian zodiacs used the crab. In the Dendera zodiac, however, they gave it a name, claria, meaning cattle folds, a corral into which cattle are driven for safekeeping at night. The Arabic name for this constellation was Al-Sartan, he who holds. Now, there is no word for crab in Hebrew. Crabs were unclean things that they didn't even dignify with a name. In the Aramaic, which is closely related to Hebrew, the name given to this constellation was Sartano, meaning who holds. The Greek karkinos, holding or encircling. Now, of course, all these would be true of the cattle or sheep fold where the animals are pinned up for safekeeping at night. The brightest star in it, tegmine, meaning holding. Another, akubene, meaning sheltering or hiding place both Hebrew and Aramaic, the same on that. Another, Arabic, Ma'alaf, meaning assembled thousands. And another Arabic name, another star in it, Al-Himarain, 
the kids or lambs. So you have then the fold where the sheep are assembled for safekeeping. Now close to this <clears throat> are two minor constellations, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the Great Bear and the Lesser Bear, and again, a totally botched up name. No bear is shown in any Chaldean or Egyptian or Persian or Hindu zodiac. It was the Greeks who botched this one up. The way they show it, Ursa Major, now you know what a little tail a bear has. Ursa Major has a tail fully as long as a wolf's tail, and Ursa Minor has a tail about twice as long as a wolf's tail. So that's no bear. Incidentally, the present North Star is in the tip of Ursa Minor's tail. Now, how did they botch up this name for bear? Well, in Hebrew, the word dover means a fold for animals, sheep fold, cattle fold. The Hebrew dove means rest or security. And there's neither rest nor security when you're around bears, I can assure you. Well, where did they get it? There's a Hebrew word of somewhat similar sound, but of different spelling, dov, meaning a bear. So, somebody, the Greeks were so contemptuous of all other people. All of humanity was divided into two groups, Greeks and all others who were barbarians. It didn't matter if you had twice the culture that he had, you were still a barbarian if you weren't a Greek. And therefore, they were too contemptuous of other people ever to bother getting any of their language straight. You note that all the Greek travelers and historians writing about Egypt always mangle the names of the Egyptian pharaohs till it's impossible to recognize them, except for these Greek writers tell about some incidents in that pharaoh's reign, which you can identify from the Egyptian records. A particular pharaoh did that <coughs> particular thing. So they weren't going to bother trying to figure out what was right. They heard the, the Hebrew name Dove, a bear, and Dove. Well, same thing. We'll call it a bear. The brightest star in Ursa Major has the name Dube, meaning a herd or a flock. In Ursa Minor, the brightest star is this tip of the tail, the North Pole Star. And in Arabic, it was called al Rukaba, the one on which things turn or revolve. Now, at the time these zodiac signs were named, that was not the Pole Star. Alpha Draconis, the brightest star in the constellation Draco, the dragon, a good many degrees away from our present pole star, was then the North Star. And how did they figure out that at the time we would be studying this thing, this one was going to be our North Star, the one that is turned on? Well, when the dragon was cast down, where do you find the center of things? In the lesser sheepfold. Remember that the ancient name for these were the sheepfolds. Why the smaller of the two, the lesser instead of the, lar and the larger one? Where have you found the elect? in the majority or in the minority. So, it is picked with perfect consistency, the lesser sheepfold, the elect who have all the time desired a better country. Two bright stars found in this, in addition to al-Rukaba, 
are kokab, meaning awaiting him who is coming, and al kaid, the assembled ones. Well, as to Ursa Major, the great bear, the Arabs called it al naish, the assembled. The brightest star in it, dube, meaning herd or flock in Arabic. The next brightest, merak, a Hebrew word meaning the flock. Another is named, and this looks like a Greek name, Theda, meaning visited or guarded. Another bright star, Megrez, meaning separated. And finally, in Arabic, al kathra meaning covered. Now here you have a bit of symbolism which wouldn't have meant anything outside of the Bible. Ordinarily, you think of the meaning of forgiveness <clears throat> as meaning that whatever penalty there would have been will not be inflicted. But the Bible's idea of divine forgiveness goes much farther than that. In one place, you remember one of the Psalms. It says, As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our sins from us. And in many places, the Bible quotes God as saying that I will not remember your sins. They will be covered up as with a cloud. Now, the whole idea of forgiveness in the Bible is that your sins are just covered up and blotted out. They're not there to be seen anymore. It's not merely suspension of the punishment, but it's that they are no longer to be seen. So, this star meaning covered makes sense with our religion. You can't fit it anywhere into the pagan religions of any of these ancient peoples who named these constellations, and some of them named the stars. Well, God speaks, you know, of us as his sheep, and he will gather us safely into a fold. For example, Ezekiel 34, verses 12 to 17. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people, and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them to their own land, and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers, and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. All right, finally getting around to the twelfth sign, completing the circle, Leo the Lion. This sign is found in all the most ancient zodiacs. The Egyptian, including the temples at Dendera and Esna, the Mithraic zodiacs in Persia, the Hindu zodiacs. Now the Dendera zodiac shows this lion treading on a serpent, treading him down with his front feet. The Egyptian name given to the constellation, P. Menticium, the pouring out. The zodiac at Dendera shows the lion treading down a serpent and a bird of prey perched on the serpent, ready to start eating the carcass, and standing by is a woman holding two cups. Beneath this sign is written, Knem, meaning he who conquers. Now, the Hebrew name for this constellation Leo is particularly significant. There are six different Hebrew words meaning lion, but they have differing significance. And aria means a lion hunting down his prey. Not just merely a lion, but a hunting lion. The brightest star in this constellation, Leo, 
regulus, meaning treading underfoot. The second brightest, Denebola, the judge who comes. Third, Algeba, the exaltation. Fourth, Minkir al-Assad, the tearing by the lion. Another, al dafera the enemy put down. Another, Deneb Alasid, the judge who seizes. Another, Sarkam, a Hebrew word meaning the joining. Now you remember I told you that the temple at Dendera showed the clue to where you have the beginning and ending points on this circle. That was the riddle of the Sphinx. And that name Sphinx comes from the Greek word Sphingo to join. And where do you join the two ends to form the circle? And they put the figure of the Sphinx between Virgo and Leo. The Sphinx had the head of a woman, so you began with the constellation Virgo, and the body of a lion, so you finished with the constellation Leo. That was the riddle of the Sphinx. Well, you know who the lion is. Revelation 5, verse 5. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And God speaks sometimes of his pouncing upon his enemies like a lion. Isaiah 42, verses 13 to 20. And it's interesting to note that while he is threatening disaster to his enemies, at the same time he's expressing his care for his own people. Yahweh shall go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holden my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now I will cry out like a travailing woman. I will both destroy and devour at once. I will waste mountains and hills and dry up all their herds. I will make the rivers islands and I will dry up the pools. And I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. Hear, ye deaf, and look, ye blind, that ye may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger that I sent? Who is blind as he that is perfect, and blind as Yahweh's servant? Seeing many things, but thou observest not. Opening the ears, but he heareth not. Well, beneath the front feet of Leo, the lion, is the constellation Hydra, the serpent. That's an immense constellation extending over a hundred degrees in the sky. The very name Hydra of it means he is abhorred. Resting on the back of this serpent is the constellation Crater, the cup. You remember the Egyptians had some hint of that, even garbled up. They had this woman holding two cups. But here is shown a huge cup resting on the back of the serpent that is being trodden down by the lion. What's the meaning of it? <clears throat> the cup of the wrath of God. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 10, and 16, verse 19. If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And the great city was divided into three parts, 
and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then, perched on the back of Hydra, the serpent, Corvus, the raven. You remember a raven or a crow as a carrion bird eating the carcasses of dead things. And it's shown perched on the back of Hydra, tearing at his flesh. In the Dendera Zodiac, the name written there is Herna. Her meaning the enemy, Na, breaking up or failing. Now let's briefly go back over this. The first sign of the twelve, Virgo, the woman with a branch in one hand and a few stalks of wheat with the seed grains in the head in the other. Remember, the seed of the woman was to be the Redeemer, also identified as the branch. Libra, the scales. You remember from time immemorial, the scales have been the symbol of justice and judgment weighing. And you remember that the two most brilliant stars in this constellation, one had a name meaning the price which is deficient, the price of death which a man could pay was still deficient, and the other star, the price which covers, the death of Christ that paid for our sins. The third constellation, Scorpio. The scorpion trying to sting the heel of the figure of Ophiochus, shown as a mighty man who is treading on the scorpion and holding in both his hands a serpent. The serpent's open jaws are reaching up toward a smaller constellation, the crown. And Ophiochus is dragging the serpent away so he can't seize the crown. And at the same time, treading down the scorpion, although he's being stung in the heel while he's doing it. In this same <coughs> sector of the zodiac is also the constellation Hercules, a mighty warrior, one foot evidently wounded, but the other foot set on the head of Draco, the dragon. The fourth sector, Sagittarius, the centaur. As I say, illustrative of the two natures of Jesus Christ. And he is shown with a bow in his hand, an arrow drawn back to full length, ready to let fly. And the arrow is aimed right at the heart of Scorpio. The fifth Capricornus, the goat. And you remember that this was the most peculiar goat that anybody ever saw. The front half of it was a goat, all right. And the rear half had the body and tail of a fish. Now, the goat half was shown collapsing in death, the legs buckled under it and the head drooping. But the rear half, this body and tail of the fish, was wriggling with all sorts of life. So, you remember now that uh, on the Day of Atonement, the sacrifice for all the people was a goat. And by the death of the goat, life was given to them. And remember, the fish, as I say, became the early emblem of the Christians. Aquarius, the figure of a man holding this great jug or urn, tipped so that out of the mouth of it is pouring a great stream of water, the water of life, which Christ said he would give to all of us. Then. 
we go on with the seventh, Pisces, the fish, and so on, that we have taken in detail tonight. Now take any or all of these signs of the zodiac. Try to make sense out of them in the light of any pagan religion you can think of, and it won't work. The pagans had them. They didn't understand them. You see, our early ancestors, the next few generations after Adam, were living among the pagan pre-Adamite peoples, and they naturally talked about their religion, and these things got out. For example, our religion is absolutely unique. It has the sacrifice being made by God in order to save man. Now that didn't make sense to these pagans, so they twisted it around, and in all pagan religions you will find that whenever man gets to be prosperous or has a bit of good luck, the gods become jealous of him, and so man has to make a sacrifice expensive enough that it really hurts in order to placate the angry and jealous gods. Now, we didn't get our idea of sacrifice from them. That's a cinch. They got theirs from us and couldn't understand it and garbled it up. Similarly, they were told what these constellations were, and they kept the idea. Some people carried the idea as far as India, where you had these zodiacs among the Hindus, and, of course, all through the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, Egypt, Greece, Rome. Oh, they tried to weave some legends around them, but it didn't make much sense. They didn't understand it. They did remember the name and the figure, although, as I say, with the one exception of Scorpio, it doesn't make sense at all. You cannot get any indication of the figure out of the pattern of the stars. So obviously they were told it from a source which had figured this out, not because the stars looked like these things, but because he wanted to put a series of twelve great figures to remind you of twelve important factors that would be explained in more detail eventually in the Bible. Now, of course, among the pagans, botching it up and debasing it, they developed the legends about how the different stars and planets and so on influenced your character, and according to which one was just rising over the eastern horizon, you might be intelligent or you might be stupid. You might be good-natured or you might be irritable or whatever it might be. Silly rot, of course. But go back to where they got this from and you'll find it makes sense by one standard only, and that is the standard of the Bible. 